sat down. I'm like, okay, now it's time to perform, be the best MC in the world. And Flan sat down and started typing on her laptop. And I'm like, oh, I don't have her attention. This is a bad thing. I'm not doing enough. And she just typed, typed, typed until she finally came onto stage when it was her turn to speak. And when I, for the first time, interacted with Flan, something shifted in me and I understood you don't need to be more. You don't have to be the most. You just have to be you. And that is where freedom comes from. That is where the be free part of the be free movement comes in. It's not something that you need to step into. It's something that you need to become. Because when you're free, you allow yourself the power to be whomever you are. And Flan kept on involving me with the be free movement throughout the years. And it's the fifth year now of be free. And I have a strong belief that this is the year of five. We have five senses, we've got five fingers. It's a complete number and we're moving into that era and for Be Free to be standing for five years still, still impacting the lives of kids in Namibia, going and decentralizing itself so that every community can feel what it means to be free. We had the opportunity to do the Be Free Inclusivity, which was a queer-centered Be Free movement where we literally looked at the community of people that are ostracized, that are moved out of society and we showed them and had a moment to understand what it means to be on the other side. And that's what Be Free does. It allows the youth to see themselves in spaces that they're usually not invited into. They're allowed to see themselves as benefits to society and to themselves constantly, because that is something we need to reinforce. The idea that we are perfect, the idea that we are these magnificent beings is a lie. And the Be Free movement allows us to break those shackles see ourselves so who we truly are, look at our imperfections and realize that those are our true strengths. While I was sitting and preparing, I was sitting down and I was assuming there were going to be a lot more young people, but I'm happy we have all of you here today. <laughs> and while I was writing down, there was something that Helena spoke to me about. She's like, speak about the future leaders of tomorrow. And I sat down and I wrote out the initials and it said F-L-O-T, which is FLOT. Now, FLON is F-L-O-N, and there's a very big similarity between the two. It's just two letters that change, and that's the T for the future leaders of tomorrow and the N in FLON for Namibia. When you take those two letters and you bring them down and you look at that difference, what it literally means is today Namibia. FLOT merging with, FLOT merging with FLON, the future leaders of tomorrow merging with the first lady of Namibia, shows us that today Namibia we can change. Talking now allows us to change. Bringing conversation forward of what is happening is how it works. And this is my alarm reminding me that you have a lot of things to do today. <laughs> but all I want to say in full encapsulation of everything, um, something that Flan said at the Be Free Static in August 2018 was, Be Free is there to encourage you to seek out assistance from someone that can give you proper information. And that is something that a lot of our youth do not have access to. It's proper information to help them get to the next level of their lives. And Be Free has created a space, a safe space for young people from any walk of life to come to a platform, to come to a space and feel heard, feel understood and feel seen and feel truly free for once in their lives. So from my side, as someone that is now 25 and then has been part of this amazing movement for four years, going on my fifth year next year as well. Just keep on growing. Remember that together we are stronger. John Mafangeo has a piece that he released in 1984 that says hope and optimism in spite of the current difficulties. And currently we have many difficulties, but when we come together, when we stand as one nation, as one economy, through Be Free, we are able to become free as a nation. So believe in our young leaders, invest in our young leaders, and allow something like Be Free to take us to the next step by standing together. Thank you very much. A really insightful testimony from Rodilio. Uh, I'm sure everyone loved it. I'm sure everyone was listening attentively to it. And one thing I just want to highlight from Rodilio's testimony is that most of the B3 uh, initiatives and discussions actually decentralized. I remember about a month ago, we had a discussion in the big settlements, just as you're leaving Bentuk. And it was actually what I engaged in a lot of panel discussions, but this panel discussion was very special for me because we actually involved young people that are in the circumstances. We allow them to be themselves in their circumstances and for them to speak about their problems openly. And not only speak about their problems, but also provide solutions to their problems. 
And that's one thing I love about B3. It's a non-judgmental movement, basically. We do not really care if you're queer, if you're bisexual. We include everyone because we mean being you is being your strengths, basically. You are you have find your strengths in your imperfections. So now we're gonna have the project overview of the hashtag B3 from David Kawasev, who is a senior youth officer for the Ministry of Sports, Youth and National Services. And also from Stephen Hagarib, who is the head of programs for the One Economy Foundation. The floor is yours. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you very much. My name is David Kavaseb, popularly known as Bonnie. For the practical reasons, I am a youth worker. I prefer that tone. Um, the other two things about me is, this is only the second time I'm wearing a suit. <laughs> it's so special, the first time was my wedding and now this, so this is only second to my wedding, okay? Um, the other is, I also don't read speeches. I normally just talk, so this time I thought I'm going to read so that I don't miss anything. If you allow me, Madam Kinkos, Monica Kinkos, the First Lady, and of course our Minister, thank you very much for coming to Damara Sieve. The old compound, you are most welcome. Embrace the dust because it will not last. Ne? Very soon, there will be some infrastructure that will remove the dust. As I said, my name is David Kavasep. I am the Senior Youth Officer working here at the Windhoek Multipurpose Youth Resource Center. And I was asked to share my feelings and thoughts about this new venture uh, we are about to embark upon. Yes, it is a personal venture embedded in years of experience in youth development work, once as a youth myself, and for the most part, as a youth worker. I was born and bred in Karatura myself and have a lot of stories to tell. One such story is that my experience at the youth center as a primary school learner uh, I got my first drama lesson in miming. So basically miming is using only gestures, gestures and movement to act out a role or a play. This required me to make something out of nothing by way of making up a character that does not exist and bring it to life. These elementary lessons became lifelong learning as it continued not only to shape my character, but my personal and professional growth. Hence, I can argue that those lessons were my safety nets, as it kept me safe from various social ills of the time. Furthermore, I was able to use the skills to build resilience to overcome the socioeconomic challenges along the way. As such, the youth and children of, of the day now more than ever need protection. They need protection against the prevailing contemporary social ills, such as domestic and gender-based violence, alcohol and substance abuse, child labor, HIV and AIDS, among others. My experience shows that the safety nets are continuing to widen as modern society becomes more and more individualistic. Not so long ago, communities used to raise children collectively. Today, they are, in most part, left to fend for themselves due to broken households, school dropouts, lack of social protection, and so on. This is evident with the increasing number of children and youth on the streets trying to make an ends meet, Zula to survive as we call it nowadays. The project Be Free Sender brings us all in retrospection. It brings to light an observation that that things have changed and responses need to be aligned to this, uh, to best address these changes. One such response is to start early by deploying holistic early childhood development programs and activities. Furthermore, it promises programs and activities that, that bring about tangible results to have meaningful impacts in the lives of our young people. As youth workers at the Youth Center, we encounter, say, a 30-year-old young person who cannot draft a CV. Needless to say, use a computer. The argument is, let us instill these valuable skills and knowledge at a tender age so that our young people will be able to make meaningful lives for themselves and their family links in good time. The current multipurpose youth resource center as it is, 
operates as an access point for mainly out-of-school youth since 1994 under the Commerce Regional Youth Office, the Ministry of Sport now, Sport, Youth and National Service. It, it provides them with diverse youth development opportunities such as basic skills training in computer, tailoring, enterprise development and psychosocial support, and much more. The children and youth that access the center on a daily basis are mainly from the surrounding localities, Damara Sieve, Vambu location, Herero location, uh, Dolam, as far as Dolam, Komasdal, and you name the few. The children and youth, oh, pardon me, the, let me just repeat that. The children and youth that access the center on a daily basis are mainly from the surrounding localities and are faced with an array of socioeconomic challenges such as unemployment, ill health, poverty and hunger, and access to free Wi-Fi. Therefore, in essence, the Project Be Free model is aimed at addressing the gray area that prevails between home, school, and street life, as perceived not only by the youth themselves, but by all the key role players in child and youth development arena. It will be a catalyst for youth development as it will provide extensive, fo extensive and focused access to youth development programs and activities early on in their lives. Hence, the Be Free Center will serve as a gateway mainly for, for in-school youth and children to prepare for a life after school, a life that requires them to become responsible adults contributing to national development agendas. In conclusion, I always wanted to say that. Um, communities, youth, parents, sympathizers of youth and development partners will have to pull together to ensure that this model meets its, its, its intended goals. It is only through the smart partnerships of this nature that government can successfully address the plight of the youth. Now my slogan, I feel free, Project Be Free, I see you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much to Mr. David for that. Um, and just to complement that, we are also now going to be hearing from Stephen Bernardes. Stephen after five, Bernardes before 5 p.m. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Rain class, medach. Hey, to go. Can't even go to the other languages. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Stephen Bernardes Karakjai. I'm the head of programs at the One Economy Foundation. I have the pleasure of sharing the beef, the project Beef Free with us today. Um, beef Free has been uh, Project Beef Free was born as a result of engaging over a hundred thousand young people uh, from fourteen regions across Namibia, Southern Africa, as far as Europe, as far as the United States. And from those conversations, having non-judgmental uh, non -judgmental conversations and, and thematic conversations allowed us to have young people articulate their challenges and the key issues that they have. The b Killings showed us that there is a pressing need for us to have integrated uh, services and resources that help young people to be able to actualize and, and find their full potential. Our long-term vision, even as Bonnie has shared, it has always been for us to have to transition towards a physical building where adolescents and young people can be in a community where they feel accepted, understood, and heard. The intent has always been for us to create an enabling environment for young people to realize their potential. Um, and this has been a moment as for me, uh, particularly because even as, I was, as, I was, as we were coming here, thinking about the work that we have been doing at the Multipurpose Youth Center that Bonnie was speaking about since 94, I had the pleasure to also participate in as part of the Young Achievers, having a youth group here that we could be engaging on a Saturday every week uh, between two and four o'clock and engaging young people that are like-minded, that are passionate about changing their world, 
Um, and having that community allowed me to be able to leapfrog from some of the challenges that I had in my own personal life as well and be able to encourage those guys to do so as well. So as we're speaking about Project B3, I'm, the needs that, are, that, that we've been addressing, right, that we're going to address through Project B3 are a result of extensive consultation, particularly with young people. As, you've, as I've mentioned earlier, we've engaged about 100,000 100, young people. And it's hearing those stories on a day-to-day -day basis through every brief engagement. Um, as you know, we have our briefings are normally pre-COVID. Uh, we're about two hours with about three to four hundred, sometimes eight hundred young people in a in an event, and would plan an event for two hours, and it would end up being at that event for five six hours. By the time we're done at four p.m., we have conversations, engagements, questions, and that takes us through to about seven eight p.m. Uh, sometimes, and then the young people in that engagement were able to articulate their specific challenges and needs that they were having. We remain cognizant of the vulnerabilities and the risks that young people are facing, as we're hearing from each one of them, the challenges they are facing at home, the issues they are facing in the communities, in the schools, whether it's teenage pregnancy, whether it's feeling uh, peer pressure, whether it's feeling uh, dis uh, despondent, whether it's feeling uh, some feeling they can't speak to their parents. Others who are articulating and saying, I've had trauma in my life and I didn't know how to articulate it. I didn't know that there was trauma that I was going through until I got to a brief. And we've also engaged with frontline service providers, including police officers, social workers, life skills teachers, healthcare workers, church leaders, um, and hear from the people that are in the ecosystem of young people because young people do not operate within a vacuum. They don't live within a vacuum. They're part of a community. They're part of a system. And so it's also important for us to be able to understand what are the challenges that these people are facing and hearing from those in the frontline uh, service uh, field to hear what are the key challenges they are mentioning that young people are facing. And then as a result as well, through our Be Free campaign and the Break Free campaign and the Problematic Mindsets report, which we launched last year, dealing with uh, ex-offenders, and inmates understanding the, the drivers of violence, all of this culminated into what we're doing today. While we've raised sufficient funding to ensure that the building construction is completed, we are cognizant um, of the importance of the sustainability and collaboration that is needed for us to move forward. And we look forward to forging strong partnerships and with those who share our values and can cultivate and empower Namibian youth and create a safe space also for those uh, such as their parents and other frontline service providers. We're excited about this opportunity to harness the dynamic transformative elements of our Be Free. So the Be Free events that we have hosted um, are each identical in its form, but different in its substance. And we're super excited to be able to bring that together, that energy, that vibrancy into a building that, that can almost continue. So people will always say like, when are you guys coming back? Uh, when are you gonna have another Be Free again? This is gonna be a sustained Be Free every day. <laughs> Um, and an important lesson that we've learned from our Be Free movement is also the value of multi-sectoral -sector -sector uh, partnerships. And we're very excited to be engaging with like-minded service providers um, and being mindful, of course, of the project cost and the implications that come as a result thereof. We are also consciously building a sustainable financial model that is going to be able to make sure that this project runs um, and is able to touch young people's lives. I'm going to show you guys where I'm going. Okay, so we got that together. So our overarching goals of Be Free are, are pretty much seven. It's, and it's really taking what we've learned from the young people and saying, how can we synthesize that into the big issues? What are the big issues that young people are facing? And what they've raised is we need adolescent-friendly entertainment, a safe space where they can have recreational uh, engagements, where they can have fun and also access services. Secondly, they also raise that they need a, a, a health facility and which is an adolescent-friendly clinic where they can be able to ac access healthcare, which is non-judgmental, where they feel comfortable, where they feel respected, and that their confidence is also kept. And then the third one is around the issues of undealt with trauma. So a lot of young people also spoke about the challenges around rape that they have experienced, underlining trauma that they have experienced. And so it's really saying, how do you facilitate a space for young people to access regular emergency uh, services? Um, so that they're able to deal with the violence, especially for young survivors. Then the fourth one is character building, which is really strengthening the resilience of our adolescents and young people. Gender responsive programming, making sure that our programs are responding to the uh, holistic enough that they speak to both uh, or different genders, but at the same time, 
is targeted enough to be able to understand the nuances and challenges that young boys are facing is different to what young girls are facing and being able to program specifically for each gender. Um, and we're also cognizant, of course, of the development needs uh, of young men relative to women. Community outreach is also a key work. That's what we've been doing for the last uh, five years, is going to different communities, uh, would engage in the different areas as we're speaking, and that's going to continue in our Project Be Free as well, where we're going to provide school and community-based information on how to deal and seek services, uh, mental health interventions, gender-based violence, talk about unintended pregnancies, substance abuse, bullying, constructive coping mechanisms, to name a few. What we're also um, con uh, cognizant of is that there's a lot of capacity constraints and challenges um, in the ecosystem that serves young people. And therefore, what we also want to do is develop accredited training programs where we upskill young people, community groups, corporates, frontline service providers to be able to better serve their young people. I will be speaking to us through a little bit of the components of Project Be Free and, the f and what the facility uh, comprises of. The facility is comprised of about several interactive spaces, namely the Adolescent Friendly Clinic, the Yo Hub, which is a futuristic technologies, resource center, the training center, and the admin building. These multifunctional and dynamic buildings give rise to the central, uh, give rise to a central courtyard interaction, which will allow for a sense of community and a place for young people to express and, and grow. So they're going to pretty much speak to each other and be interlinked there. As I go through the the specific components, I'm going to highlight the specific programs that I want to um, speak to in each of the components and each of the hubs there. So the first one is, again, from our learnings edutainment hub, uh, where we endeavor to create a transformative change and foster character development by engaging young people with activities that are both fun and educational, and also provide a space for young entrepreneurs to be able to market and sell their, some of their products there. So that will be the edutainment hub. Then next one we're going to have is the wellness hub which is really offering the psychosocial support, counseling, pro bono services, um, and also have the presence of the youth pastor either, as well as to facilitate prayer and solitude as well in that space. Then the next one we're going to have is the Youth Opportunity Hub and Innovation. This hub is really with the idea to future-proof our young people, specifically their skills, and introduce them to the fourth industrial revolution. Um, the hub will provide a platform where B-Free innovators can design solutions and solve challenges faced by local communities. We will also allow for members of the Innovation Hub to be able to work on relevant projects while feeling a sense of impact at the same time. We want to create at the Innovation Hub also a place, a platform where local challenges, local problems uh, can be solved by technology. So encouraging young people to come and participate and say, what is the problem, a challenge that you're seeing in your specific community? And how can you use technology to start to solve it? And then we'll partner, of course, with other stakeholders to strengthen and increase accessibility, uh, for particularly vocational training for uh, those who are also challenged with that as well. Oh, sorry, I didn't move it. So, and then, and then what we want to also do there is to partner with existing stakeholders to make sure that we provide vocational training um, for out of school youth, unemployed young adults to be able to enhance the skills and also address the issues around unemployment. Then the next one we have is the training hub. The training hub is going to speak to the issues around capacity building, as was mentioned in our objectives. Uh, the training facility really meets the capacity needs and fills knowledge, the, the knowledge and skills gaps with a particular focus on frontline service providers, young people, parents, and corporates. And the training is going to be positioned as part of our sustainability efforts to make sure that we are able to sustain the project. And so we'll be charged against a fee uh, for particularly uh, people that can afford it. And then we'll also be able to ring fence specific programming for uh, community members, young people that cannot afford it. Um, and this has been as a result of our trainings that we've been doing for the last three and four, three and a half years. We've over trained over a thousand frontline service providers, especially around issues around gender-based violence, sexual and gender-based violence, sexual reproductive health, mental health issues, um, building a strong um, corporate space where young people, uh, people are actually feeling safe uh, and dealing with the stress and coping mechanisms, et cetera. So it's really a continuation of the work that we're doing. And then moving on, we're going to have the Break Free Anti-Violence Center, which is going to be forming part of the training as well, where we're going to provide 
specifically develop violence prevention and response curricula that is informed by the learnings that we've gained both from our B-Freaky learnings as well as the problematic mindsets. Um, the center will also offer a constructive skills and coping mechanisms for people that are impacted directly by violence and those who are impacted indirectly as well. Then the next one we're going to have is the plug, which is the after school hub and after school resource. We provide additional resource support um, to for academic learning uh, for specifically in school youth. Um, and then in the spirit of really promoting the culture of reading, we're going to be also deliberate about having books and literature that is Namibian and African um, primarily, but of course others as well. And then the admin hub we're going to have is going to focus on the office space for professionals as well as um, providing support for community grade based groups who are not able to access, for example, office facilities, where they be able to get a computer, uh, where they be able to have a desk, access to Wi Fi, bring a computer, be able to uh, work from there, have access to a telephone, et cetera. Um, and this really tries to address the issues around removing barriers to, um, to office for, for specifically community based groups and young professionals. And then some of them will also be charged at a nominal fee there as well. So last but not least, I'm gonna speak about the SHAP, which is really the medical health that we're gonna provide, a youth-friendly clinic that will revolutionize our healthcare services for young people. Um, this landmark project will really commence with the adolescent-friendly clinic, which is through, gonna be through the CHAP um, program. And the project seeks to trailblaze and, and really provide unique health services, uh, which not only cater to the physical needs of young people, but also the psychosocial needs. Healthcare, as, as we've seen, has always been, where well, young people are always sharing with us and saying that they don't feel safe to speak about their challenges they're having. Um, and when they come and seek healthcare, they always feel like they are not able to articulate their specific needs. Young people have shared, for example, when they uh, speak to a healthcare professional, when they ask, for example, they want to get access to condoms or to contraceptives, uh, they may feel uh, uncomfortable. Or also we find that maybe there's an STI, but because the, uh, of, uh, because the result of uh, unprotected sex, but when they seek healthcare services, they are ashamed and embarrassed to speak about it. Um, and that's why we're really thinking about creating a, a safe space, an adolescent-friendly safe space, where they can actually articulate their health challenges they're having. Through extensive engagements through our BFI dialogues, we've been able to also engage with nurses and people from the Ministry of Health that have really also come into BFI and articulated their own challenges as well as healthcare professionals, but also being able to hear from the young people what are the young people's challenges and hopefully facilitate a little bit stronger there as well. We acknowledge also that because of the fiscal challenges that we face as a country, that we don't always have the luxury to build um, specific facilities for young people and they have and the government what it has done is really restructure certain certain infrastructure to be able to repurpose it for young people but what we want to do through project b is really build a center for for for, for young people where they can be basically access emergency to regular services psychosocial support psychological support um, break the stigma around help seeking where healthcare professionals who work in the Project Be Free are actually trained in how to communicate with young people, understand the dynamics of young people, are able to verbalize to what, uh, what young people are feeling, and able to understand the language. So when a young, pe young person says that um, I got an STI as a result of being 40, many people won't understand. Or when they say that somebody plugged me to an event, that language doesn't always make sense. So it's helping healthcare professionals almost decodify the youth language as well. And also the health center provides, will also provide a pro bono psychological support as I've mentioned, and also have a, a, a pastor on site for young people that are really having challenges around trying to make sense of life and ways that they wanna go, see issues around purpose, existential issues that they are facing as they're transitioning from youth into adulthood and really help facilitate some of that challenges as well. What we're also excited is to provide uh, emergency um, medical support as well to, to young people.
We will additionally also provide for school and community-based groups, of course, um, services by going out and providing information uh, because information is critical to prevention. And that's where we want to position ourselves. We're always saying, let's, as, as far as possible, prevent uh, early pregnancy, unintended pregnancy. Let us, as far as possible, prevent violence. Let's, as far as possible, prevent dysfunction in the home. But when we cannot, and if that is not possible, and the result has already happened, that there is a space for those to be able to receive the support that they need. What we're also excited about is building a life skills curricula that is going to be developed in the Namibian context, uh, which we're going to make available to parents, uh, guardians, and key stakeholders to go through as well. But it's really going to be a curricula that helps cement and complements what is already existing, but really cements our values as BFU and for young people. Um, we've also found that these people that have asked for the center is going to have a specific focus for young people between the ages of 14 and 25. And some people have asked, what about young people that are in between the ages of 10 and 13 who are also going through early puberty, who are also having these challenges, may not be able to articulate that? Is there a space for them to do so? Now, as per the Child Care and Protection Act, we can really only offer services um, to young people, particularly from the ages of 14. Um, that they can ask for services uh, without parental consent. So what we're going to be able to also do with Project B3 is ring fence certain, certain programs targeting specifically that age group between the ages of 10 and 13. We are remaining true to the B3 values, really, um, which is to have open, frank conversations that allow us to normalize conversations around sex, normalize conversations around help seeking, as even uh, Rodilo has shared, that there's a lot of pain that he's carrying, but he's not able to articulate it. We must normalize those conversations where young people can be able to articulate what is it that they need. And in the spirit of partnership, we also want to commend the difficult and often th thankless work of NAPA, um, who are gonna, who's going to be a critical partner as we uh, launch this um, center. I'm going to show you a sneak peek of that. So that's going to be the phase one of the adolescent friendly clinic, um, where we're going to encompass to cover um, what I've covered, uh, what I've spoken about here, um, primarily, and through partnership with Napa Clinic, we're going to be able to articulate and be able to provide those services. They have been doing fantastic work in adolescent friendly health services already in the country. We appreciate those services they have rendered even with us through our partnership for the last nine months. Uh, where we have actually been able to pay for a registered nurse um, that is working from NAPA, um, both providing capacity building for healthcare professionals, but at the same time also uh, extending those services uh, to young people. And as we establish this clinic, we are very aware that this is a win for young people and that it's an extension of our existing work that we have been already doing. And in extending value for partnership, B3 will also offer um, facilities to youth organizations to collaborate on uh, youth-focused organizations um, as far as we can uh, support them there. Through working together with like-minded organizations, we're able to leverage not only our strengths, but their individual strengths as well, and hopefully use that to, uh, to drive us forward. And this can only really be realized as we build a conducive environment that ensures coordination of institutions and enforcing implementation. The key issue is always with fantastic ideas, with fantastic policies. We always cry about this issue, but we don't implement. Here is an opportunity for us to actually make that manifest and implement that work here. And that is going to be the overview of the full uh, program. So when you're sitting here on this dusty uh, area, take a note, take a picture. Uh, because in a couple of years, these places were transformed. An important lesson that we've also learned through our b is, of course, the multi-stakeholder partnerships. Um, and where we're relying for Project b is also for us to really take that partnership and goodwill and support that we've received for b into Project b as well. Uh, we're grateful for the financial and support as well as in-kind contributions we've received thus far from fantastic and amazing partners thus far. And we definitely want to applaud and also commend the Ministry of Youth, uh, Sport and National Service, um, who we're in a public-private partnership with, uh, due to the limited capacity and scope of the center, so that we can be able to use this to be able to complement the existing center, and at the same time provide a space for youth officers to be at our center as well, um, to be able to work from here. And it's going to be literally like a streamlined uh, support ecosystem that we're going to build here. 
And we've earmarked about 40% of our procurement uh, to young entrepreneurs between the ages of 18 and 40 so that they can contribute to this construction of this building. Uh, One Economy has made a commitment to finance the construction and the furnishing of Project Be Free uh, and will ensure project implementation that speaks to our collective strategies and ensure the maintenance of this facility. We are super excited that to donate this to the ministry upon completion of the construction. Um, and as we donate, we're gonna transfer skills, ensure the maintenance of the facility, and also use this project and part of the project as well to also um, strengthen and refurbish part of the existing multipurpose use center as well. We've made sure that our finance, financial uh, plan is viable, and that we will not be able, will not be able, will not be able to, will be able to eliminate unnecessary, unbudgeted uh, financial inputs from the ministry. This is really critical because it meets our national youth policy agenda and goals, which is around education, skills development, health and well-being, employment, economic empowerment, and civic participation. Providing facilities for young people. Um, also, we're gonna, as I mentioned before, gonna collaborate with the existing youth organizations that are in the area. We've worked together with BAS, for example, Physically Active Youth, um, and some of the other organizations that are in the area as well. We've identified about 11 youth focus areas actually in this vicinity, as well as about six schools in the surrounding area. Being aware of the limited resources that we have in, a, in comparison to our bold aspiration, as you can see, we are, this is a bold agenda. Um, we want to change the world, but we are also cognizant of the, of the resources that we need to do that. Um, and we are excited to be able to help the ministry, even in its own agenda, to be able to redirect other resources that would have necessarily used for a building such as this for other specific projects that they want to focus on. In us twinning our resources together, it will kind of help us to match objectives of building capacities for young people and also creating a safe and a conducive environment for young people to grow. This is in addition to also maintaining a close collaboration, of course, with the community members that are in the area. Um, we've engaged through about, 10, about, eight, about nine and 10 uh, focus group discussions with community groups, with young people, with service providers, uh, really proving our concept. And the case has been made that this is an integral and an important um, initiative that, we need to, that we're embarking upon. A little bit around One Economy, for those who may not know, uh, we are registered as a Section 21 company in terms of the Namibian Companies Act uh, and also as a social welfare organization, uh, being governed, of course, by an independent board of non-executive directors who drive our strategic direction. You've heard from one of our directors here, uh, Beata Lileka, who's also joined us. And our board is really reflective of our values as well um, because we have members from the first and second economy, experts from different fields, um, individuals um, and youth uh, representation as well. And that's really to ensure that the interest of that demographics is reflected in our board and from a strategic level is then flows into our programmatic level as well. And so I want to also just give a handout, a shout out to Beata Ileka and McVerin uh, Kakugaya who has joined us today um, as our board uh, directors and for their tremendous work that they have given in terms of giving us direction as we are going. As we're, as we're thinking about and running it off, one of the key things that I want to raise here is that in essence, Project Be Free is, is us, right? Project Be Free is a living organism. It is not something that we can, we're building a physical building, but more than that, the energy of Project Be Free, the spirit of Project Be Free, and Be Free movement as a result thereof as well, is really facilitating conversations with young people, stakeholders, service providers, etc. And what we're building here is not something that we want to build as a wild as a white elephant that is just going to be here for for us to have as a building. What is going to make Project Be Free in this building is the young people that are going to go through it every day. It's the conversations they're going to be having in this building. It's the services that they'll be able to access. It's going to be a Rodilio who comes through and says, for the first time, somebody hears me as I'm here. And it is going to be on a day-to-day -day basis. And following the lead of our young people, 
is addressing also the structural barriers that cause young people not to seek services. And we cannot run away from the challenges that young people are facing because they don't feel comfortable. And we cannot say young people must just grow up or just try or just do it. We have to be able to hear what is that they are saying and how do we reposition ourselves because we are there to serve them. So if our programs are no longer viable to where the young people are, we have to take the responsibility to pivot. We cannot, we cannot say this is how it's always been. <laughs> Because the world doesn't exist and stay how it's always been. It is changing, it's dynamic, it's moving. And the group of young people that are coming to the fore are changing. My generation of youth, um, I'm no longer a youth, uh, <laughs> is different to the next generation that is coming through and the needs and aspirations that they have. And we believe that this center, with all services under one roof, will enhance that help seeking for young people. We don't want young people to fall through the cracks. We don't want young people to fall out of school. We don't want young people to get pregnant. We don't want young people to be in the streets abusing substances because they don't know where to seek help. We don't want young people to be falling off track who disappear and become invisible. We want young people, Namibian youth, and the African youth, and the global youth, to fully actualize, to take their power, and to be able to say, this is what I want to become, this is what I want to do, and this is my contribution to this world. It is incumbent upon each and every one of us to invest in this development agenda. Because the issues are complex, issues are challenging, but that cannot deter us from not doing the work. That cannot deter us from saying, I'm going to step up to the plate. Because if all of us just see the problems that the young people are going through, then where do we, who says I'm the guy who's going to help solve it? And it's an audacious uh, ask for us to say, we are putting our hands forward to say we're going to be the ones. But it is all of us saying we're going to be the ones. So it's each and every person putting their hands together and saying, I'm going to contribute, whether it's in kind, whether it's finances, whether it's my services, whether it's my time, whether it's me just being a mentor to a young person, whether it's me just uh, coming to an event and setting up chairs, that is a contribution that we appreciate. Each and everyone saying that what I'm bringing to the table, the subtle of the whole is critical. And we don't say that we're gonna do it by ourselves. We don't say we um, are the experts throughout. No, we're saying that they're fantastic and incredible organizations, young people that are doing this work. And all that we're doing is facilitating a space and a platform for them to convene and have access. So we are super excited um, and saying that the con and confident that our values and our aspirations as Be Free not only resonate in the hearts of the young people that we've engaged, but will be able to continue to run through our generations. This is an ambitious 30-year project. Well, I'm thinking think about it in 30 years when I'm 60 years old and I'm a gray old man. And I want to be able to say that there's a brick that I would laid in that building and young people are benefiting as a result. I hope we can all say the same. Thank you very much. Awesome, thank you so much. That was Stephen Bernardes Haragheb the head of programs at One Economy Foundation. Um, and just very quickly, because we are on time, I just wanted to add, I think that something that's very important that Stephen has mentioned is how audacious an undertaking Project Be Free is. But I think it's that very audacious energy and spirit that compels young people and keeps us coming back. It's audacious to launch in a club. It's audacious to hand out or talk about or encourage conversations and, and, you know, facilitate comprehensive sexuality education. And that is the energy that keeps us coming back. Um, in fact, when we were driving here today with Hilma, I remember telling her how overcome I feel with emotion, right? Um, and that's because it's five years later and we are still actively in love with the brand, the platform, the movement that is hashtag be free because it's something that is audacious and by extension speaks to how audacious young people typically are. 
And speaking to those audacious young people, I'd like to invite Alina Daniel up to just share her story with us um, as a Be Free beneficiary. Very good morning to everybody and our first lady. Um, one thing that I really love about Be Free is that it allows you to explore your capabilities. And so while I was preparing my speech, I figured, why not make it a little bit poetic, Alina? And then I did just that. So here we go. Society has raised me in a cage. So small, I couldn't move, least of all speak. The bars to my cage were my windows. I could only watch, hope, and listen from a distance. My thoughts were declared invalid even before I could utter a word. In a society where age had a huge influence on decision making, I had no say, no right to say, no right to be heard, and emotions only belonged to the wealthy. In a community where I, could, I couldn't question, I had to swallow my words become totally invisible, and deal with my curiosity at the risk of making mistakes. And then, boom, I got introduced to something great, something worth being a part of. I got introduced to the project hashtag Be Free. Be Free was my way out of that cage. I needed to breathe, and in a way, Be Free acted as my oxygen. Hashtag Be Free provided a safe space and gave me a voice. Here I could freely speak my mind. I could engage in conversations that most of us were scared to have, either with ourselves or with our parents. At Be Free, I finally felt like I could be heard and it gave me confidence. With the deep heartfelt conversations that we have at hashtag Be Free events, I grew as a person and it strengthened my emotional intelligence. I became more empathetic and understanding of social issues as I, and my an understanding of social issues. Hashtag Be Free gave me a sense of belonging. I could articulate myself and there was no judgment. In Be Free, I grew wings. I learned how to fly. And with the empowering information that is handed out here, I was fueled to make better, healthier decisions. Hashtag Be Free didn't only help me grow as an individual. It helped us all as a community. As not only youth alone was involved, parents, pastors, teachers, police officers, and so many more also became involved. People started being more aware of issues that we're going through, that we as the youth were going through. Be Free has become my home and I can even and I can't say thank you enough for this great initiative. And every single day, I look forward to working more with Be Free. Thank you. With her testimony. But before we head off to our Minister of Youth, Sport and National Services, I want to touch something that I think has to be highlighted. It was when Bietha said that it takes a community to raise a child, but we've been left, the young people have been left on their own. And as Bonnie has said, it's Sula to survive. That's the word we always hear on the street. It's your life, take charge of it. But then with the B3 and when Stephen was doing his presentation, one thing I've realized is that we're bringing back the it takes a community to build a child. This is the relationship we're bringing back. And it's actually one thing I love. It's young people taking this initiative that know if the community has left us on our own, why not raise ourselves? Why not help ourselves? I mean, uh, Bertha is here. She's two years or three years older than me. And if I need assistance, I can talk to Bertha and be like, Bertha, I need assistance in this and this and this. Even though she's not an expert, her guidance will help me because with the two or three years, she has extra experience. 
But now we'll hear the remarks from our Honorable Minister of Sport, Youth and National Services, Honorable Agnes Chongarero. The floor is yours. Hand over applause, please. Good. Madam First Lady, Madam Monica Kainfos, founder and chairperson, One Economy Foundation. I saw the, oh yeah, Your Excellency, the Ambassador. I saw the, I've seen our ED in the presidency. Now, if you start there, then you are you are looking for problem, eh? Okay, okay. All protocol observed. Um, good afternoon, everybody. You know, I've learned something now. Now, now, now. Normally, they say youth doesn't have time for long speeches. <laughs> I've learned something different. I was always told with youth, be short and to the point. Youth taught me, be long and they'll still listen to you. Good. It is indeed an honor to be here at this auspicious groundbreaking ceremony in response to the socioeconomic challenges our youth are facing on a daily basis. We have had your cries. Any response to the numerous challenges faced by our future generation? Our ministry and One Economy Foundation have formalized a partnership to see how best we can cater for the needs of adolescents and young adults through the project hashtag be free. As mandated to empower the youth, our ministry takes cognizance of the increasing youth population, which results in high demand for youth-related services. The hashtag Be Free project has come at the right time. And it is in time, actually, with our strategic priority of constructing and upgrading our multipurpose youth centers to increase new intakes and enhance youth skills which remain vital. We recognize the importance of establishing relevant, responsive, and effective programs which cater to the specific needs of adolescents and young adults. We equally remain cognizant of the significant risk, particularly concerning sexual violence that is disproportionately experienced by our adolescent girls and young women and of the current unemployment rate. Thus, radical change is needed in how we address the issues of violence in Namibia. The high rates of violence include sexual and gender-based violence and shows no sign of abating. Therefore, it is imperative that we all do our part as a nation. Ladies and gentlemen, not all youth have access to quality and responsive programs supplementing the formal platforms, i.e. physical education, after school support, access to adolescent friendly health care, and so on and so on. It is against this background that we advocate for substantive, sustainable opportunities for young people of, to participate and contribute to community development, which 
project hashtag be free will provide. Addressing the current challenges of the youth is not only the ministry or one economic foundation's responsibility, but it's supreme that we all do our part in this country. There is an African proverb which says, and I quote, unquote, it takes a village to raise a child. The import of this, of the importance of this, is to say that we all need to lend a helping hand to raise the future generation and teach them how to survive with the little resources at their disposal. It is our purpose and obligation to ensure that they carry on the patent to the next generation, to create a community that is fit for Namibia. Ladies and gentlemen, smart partnership like the One Economy Foundation are what we believe in. The One Economy Foundation program facilitates dialogue with adolescents and young adults across Namibia in all 14 regions in SADC, USA, and Europe. Our ministerial youth officers, officers have also been an invaluable asset towards the creation and implementation of the hashtag Be Free Youth Dialogue in the region. It is indeed great gesture that one economic foundation will finance the construction and furnishing of the hashtag Be Free and will ensure project implementation that speaks to our collective strategic priorities and ensure consistent maintenance of the facility. I'm actually very excited as I'm standing here. I want to jump around, but I know what will be in the newspapers, okay. We are elated to inform the general public that one economic will donate hashtag be free to, to the ministry after completion. And for that, they deserve actually a round of applause, please. <laughs> this partnership will assist our ministry in attaining the key national youth policy goals and implementation of the ministry's strategic, strategic objectives, i.e. education and skills development, health and well-being, economic empowerment, as well as political and civic participation. It is exciting to note that the adolescent-friendly clinic will be part of the first phase to be constructed, as it will be responding to the urgent need to ensure our youth recognize their sexual rep reproductive health and rights also. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, I call upon the economy, uh, uh, upon the community at large to support the project, safeguard the premises, and offer our services where we can, irrespective of our qualifications, help the hashtag be free it's as, and take it as our baby, which we need to build for our future generations to reap what from what we have put there for them. So stand up and be the change that you want to be and what you want to see. With these few words, please allow me to invite the First Lady of the Republic of Namibia and the Chairperson of the One Economic Foundation, Madam Monica Kane Kos, to present the Certificate of Partnership as a tangible assurance 
of our commitment, even though that was signed already. Be bold. Be you. Hashtag break free. I thank you. Um, so thank you, Honourable Minister. Um, for, uh, for your energy, enthusiasm, and all the support um, that you've given to us, Your Excellency. Um, the Chinese ambassador to Namibia, who's been such a support um, to the One Economy Foundation, as well as to the Be Free movement. Um, I remember talking about this um, to many people, all of whom who said, it's too ambitious. And if there's somebody who always gets told, it's too ambitious, it's me. If there's somebody who always says, it can be done, it's me. And I remember sharing our vision with um, the ambassador. And he said to me, give me one week. I'll get back to you. And he came back within one week. And he said to me, I found a million for you. And that was such a big confidence boost uh, for me personally and for the rest of my staff. Because to find a million during right after a recession and right during a global pandemic was not a joke. And I, I really thank you because I think it wasn't just the million, it was the vote of confidence and it was really the trust that you put in us. <laughs> Dr. Puleng Letsi, um, our UNAIDS um, representative here at this function, thank you very much. UNAIDS is very much a key enabler um, of Be Free. Um, I am a UNAIDS global ambassador for the Start Free, Stay Free um, movement. And then we were sitting around with the rest of my staff thinking about how will we internalize my being a UNA's advocate, localize it, and make it relevant to us. And that's where we decided on the name Be Free. So it's to be free of HIV, but it's also to be free of whatever holds you back as a young person. So UNAIDS was a key inspiration in the formulation of this concept. So thank you very much. We've got a number of, of, of people, including our executive director um, at State House in the presidency, who's been an absolute support as well. It's, um, we, and I need to be sensitive here, but, but <laughs> we all have favorites. And this is absolutely one of my, my favorite EDs because she's very similar to our minister who are can do, let's resolve the issue, people. Um, and it's been an absolute pleasure working with all of these stakeholders. Um, and of course, Megan, thank you very much um, for joining us from Australia um, to this event. And that's really the beauty of what we see here, uh, because I see some of our other partners, um, Rudy from MedScheme is here, and I see many of our other partners, Una, uh, just people who've just played an unbelievable role in the formulation of where we are today. And it's really a combination of stakeholders from the public sector, it's stakeholders from the private sector, it's, uh, it's um, charities like ours, it's other NGOs, it's, it's people like our um, ambassador. Um, we've got international donors as well. We've got local donors. We've got people who give us as much as a million. And we've got people who give us as much as a hundred. Namibian dollars because every single cent matters and and that's really the value set that we've tried to build here um, so thank you for all of that but most importantly thank you to the
to 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 you guys, um, Rivaldo, Berta, Beata, um, Rodilio, and there's there's many others of you. I was staring at um, Rivaldo, trying to remember where I saw you, and you notice when you talked about the informal settlement, uh, be free. Then I was staring at you more because then I remembered that's where I saw you, um, and that's the beauty for me. It's to see Rodilio in 2017 in Wallfish Bay, um, and to see him speaking at this platform. And to see that change, um, the same with uh, Bert and many, many other young people. And many of the issues that we speak about as part of Be Free are the issues that we experience as well, ourselves um, and those around us. So this has very much been youth driven. And, and I'd like to sneak myself into that box because I, by default, I'm also youth. That's why I'm dressed like a youth today. And I've got a very young staff compliment. And I, and I said to my husband, you know what? I'm actually 31 because the average age in my office is 31. So by association, <laughs> ne, Alina, it's only fair. I'm also 31. So I need to keep on hiring younger and younger staff members so I keep the average age intact. <laughs> because you guys are getting old. Alina, last time I saw you in what? Ella Duplessis uniform. And now you're looking like... Uh, <laughs> so I, I, I really um, believe that this project is meant to be. And, and I'd like to share with you why I believe that. Um, every single person I've spoken to about Project Be Free and, and trying to get their support will either say what uh, you told me, who's one of the best life skills teachers I've ever encountered, and she's been with us. I see Alina is agreeing. It's Alina's former life skills teacher. But she's been a phenomenal force for us and a phenomenal advisor um, for us. And I remember when we spoke about it, you said to me, but this is what I've always wanted to do. And everybody we've spoken to, we spoke to Una Stierman, who's an architect who's been working for free on this project. And she said, but we've actually already conceptualized something like this. This is exactly what my husband and I, both of whom are architects, have wanted. When Bonnie heard about it, Bonnie said, but this is exactly what we need to do because Bonnie is a child who grew up in the Katitura multi-purpose, um, multidisciplinary youth center just around the corner. And he runs it. He's being humble by saying he's a youth worker, but he manages that center. And that center and this center here will be twinning because Bonnie will be very much part of the team assigned to us by the minister to make sure that the... But Bonnie is now a millennial, and that center was very well suited for the needs of millennials. But Bonnie, these Generation Zs or Zs, what is it, Generation? Gen Z, Z, okay. I called my daughter millennial and she wanted to attack me. She's a Gen Z. So we are building the equivalent of a Katatura multipurpose youth center for Gen Z because their needs, their experiences, and their exposure is different. And the likes of Bonnie will be helping us to make sure that it's a relevant experience for that generation. So it's really a 21st century multi-purpose youth center. And as this building rises, we'll be doing everything we can to build that building as well. So if we have extra paint here, we are sure as hell going to paint the multi-purpose youth center. They've got a roof that's collapsing, so we're sure as hell we'll order extra ceiling materials to fix that roof. So whatever we try and do here, we will certainly be replicating it there. There are youth advisors who work at resource centers throughout the country and will be utilizing the trainings that we do here to train all of these youth advisors so that they go and take those learnings to those multipurpose centers throughout the country. And that's how we want to scale up. What we'll also be doing and we, we, we've, we thought about this quite deeply. We, we wondered to ourselves, do we buy a building, put it onto our balance sheet, we own the building, and one day when we get tired, we sell the building and we put the money back into our balance sheet. And we said, no, this is not about us. It's not an investment that we seek to gain any benefit from. And that's when we started speaking to the Ministry of Youth and saying, but, we can buy a building, 
but we know that you also have plans because on this piece of land, there's a lot of plans that have already been designed by government around youth development. There's at least nine youth organizations within a one kilometer radius of where we are now. And we thought, but surely this is what smart partnership is about. So what the Ministry of Youth has done is they've donated 4,000 square meters to us to build a building that they want to build, but you know most government stuff. <laughs> Funding, COVID, everything is a problem these days. Um, but when I looked at the ministerial plan for youth development, and I looked at our plan, it was almost identical. So the ministry has donated a piece of land. We will construct a 30 million building on that piece of land. And when we are finished, we'll donate that 30 million building to the Ministry of Youth. We'll have occupation of the building for a period of time. I think it's 30 years, Bernardus. Is it 30 years? We'll have occupation of the building for 30 years, but the building will belong to the Ministry of um, Youth, Sport and National Service. And that to me is what a partnership is about. We were similarly thinking right now we pay, is it one or two nurses? One. We pay for one nurse um, to provide adolescent reproductive health assistance at a NAPA clinic um, on the outskirts of Katatura. And again, when we're thinking about the adolescent friendly center we're going to build here, Napa has a huge problem, and I'm sorry if I'm talking your business in public, but Napa has a huge problem with fundraising like everybody does, and they have a huge problem with the cost of um, paying rent. And again, we thought, why should we run a youth clinic ourselves when Napa does such a great job? So again, what we'll do is we'll build one of the best, if not, no, actually the best, Youth Focus Center here on this land, and Napa will run it for us. That way, they continue providing the services they've always provided, but they don't pay rent. If they pay rent, it will be a dollar. So that is really how we're looking at all of the things that we'll be doing. There's a number of um, youth groups that we've signed agreements with, some of whom will also accommodate in our facility. And they'll be providing different services to young people. We won't be providing the service. Other youth groups will provide the service. Again, with no rental cost. Because the idea here is really to provide a one-stop center for young people. And we are not sensitive about who that provider should or could be. We just care that the young person who walks in here has a full spectrum of service providers. There's an organization called the Fatherhood Foundation who will also be on premises. And the reason we want the Fatherhood uh, Foundation here is because we're very conscious of the impact of fatherlessness on young boys and the absolute void it leaves and how it directs behavior of boys and what we want to do. So I don't really like the word toxic masculinity. I prefer the word constructive masculinity. And what we will be paying attention to is building constructive masculinity so that boys grow up into good men. And I'm not insinuating they aren't good men, but they are bad men. And we want to reduce that ratio by building the right mindsets. Because Rodilio, you're right. We are talking about the future leaders of tomorrow. But we are compromising the future leaders of tomorrow by not rolling out the stumbling blocks that are in their paths. So when we speak about development, or when I speak about development of any country, uh, Megan, especially countries like Namibia that have a post-conflict background, especially countries like Namibia where we have deep and very structural socioeconomic issues, we cannot speak about development without speaking about the socioeconomic challenges that we have. So if we know that we have challenges around uh, drug and alcohol abuse, we know we have challenges around sexual violence, we know we have challenges around access to healthcare, access to education, we know we have mental health challenges, and we're not dealing with that. I think 
our socio-economic challenges will end up deeply compromising our developmental aspirations. And we do not have the luxury, not at this complex or when we're dealing with our young people, to just focus on climate, to just focus on mental health, to just focus on substance abuse, to just focus on character development. Because the reality is all of these things are impacting them at the same time. What we've done, we've talked about the Be Free sessions and how we've done it throughout the world and throughout the country. We then had focus groups as well. With 25 groups, including the community right around here, pastors, police officers, nurses, life skills teachers, um, you name them, we've engaged them. And one thing we always started in all of these focus group discussions is if you had money to build something for young people, what would you make sure that building addressed? And everything they said they would put in there is what was in the plan because the plan is evidence-based. And that's why you'll notice when Bernardus was doing his presentation, there were all these SDGs being ticked off. Because when we look at the SDGs, when we look at um, the African Union's uh, Vision 2063, when we look at the Namibian Vision 2030, when we look at the Namibian um, uh, National Development Plans, when we look at Harambe Prosperity Plan 1 and 2, it's all checked, Rudy. It's all checked. And it's not because we copied these plans. It's because we followed the evidence. And what the evidence often tells us, our religious and moral and cultural beliefs often tries to say something else. And here is a safe space where we deal in evidence. It's a place of inclusion, it's a place of safety, and it's a place of development. So we don't have the patience to have discussions about should there be sex education here? There will be sex education here. We don't have the patience to discuss about whether the queer community is welcome here. They are welcome here. Because we cannot build a Namibia that's not inclusive, that's not tolerant, and that leaves any part of its community behind. That's not how you build. So I'm, I'm thankful to people like Rodilio who continuously remind us that our values and what we do must echo what we say. And that's a commitment I make to you, but all, to all young people, that this is a judgment-free zone. We also look at, um, and I almost committed a big crime because I see my sister Sheila is in the audience there from UNFPA, um, and, and, and the role they've played here, I also, it, it, it um, and again, I don't want to talk nonsense, but there has been a trend in UNFPA of he having female country representatives. And the level of pragmatism, I hear a man chuckling here at the back somewhere. <laughs> but, but the pragmatism um, with which UNFPA has approached our belief systems, how we do things, I can only be grateful for. And you'll notice, uh, Sheila, and it's not any nudging from UNFPA, that we do put reproductive health at the center um, of this, because we do know that a young person who delays their sexual debut, who delays motherhood, and focuses on education and self-development, has a higher chance of climbing out of poverty circles. We know this. We know the challenges that young people are having in terms of accessing reproductive health issues. And when we talk about reproductive health, when we talk about teenage pregnancy, somehow we imagine a young teenage girl. But <laughs> immaculate conception stopped with Jesus. These girls aren't impregnating themselves. So we need to think about the reproductive health needs of young boys as well. Because often a young boy contracts a STI. And I, I'm not looking at you, Rivaldi, because I think you've contracted a STI, because he looked at me like, why are you looking at me? But they don't know where to go to. So, so Berta called it peer what? 
No, man, you use the peer parent team. So Rivaldo will rather go to another young person and say, hey, my friend, brah, I've got this stuff, man. And that friend of his will probably just say, no, go get some coal and put it on and it'll be okay. No, it's not going to be okay. And a lot of these things result in infertility in young people. And I always tell young boys who like these tight jeans that Rivaldo has, be careful of these tight jeans that are so <laughs> fashionable. There's consequences to these tight jeans you guys like. They're not meant for you. There's fertility consequences to these things. So we have open and frank discussions about these things all the time. And we do not look at it just from the perspective of the girl child. We do look at it from the perspective of the boy child as well. We, I've got a speech here, but I'm not going to read it. Um, I just really wanted to, to highlight a couple of things. Um, and the one big thing is the donation that we've talked about, the absolutely fantastic partnership. And in her absence, I'd like to, through you, Honorable Minister, to thank your Deputy Minister as well, who's, who's been an incredible powerhouse in making sure that this happened within the timelines that we had mutually agreed on. So we will be donating the building. It is a 30 million project. We've raised 80% of that 30 million. And we are 100% sure we'll manage to raise the rest of the 20%. Um, so that money is sitting in the bank, so there's no financing problems. Because I know government is always worried about people with these big ambitions, and then we come with all these little side terms that you must now step in. No, we've got a sustainable funding plan as well to make sure that the building pays for itself. So we're very confident that we're not going to become a burden in terms of having a good idea, but not having the capacity to implement. Um, we also often see that communities matter. And Bernada spoke about us thinking about this 30 million very much from the perspective of we will be providing preference to people from the surrounding community within our procurement budget. So if we need a plumber, we would like a plumber from the surroundings because it's their building as well. So we have engaged community members in the nearby areas. I know Una's mom, does she still live here? So, so Una used to live just across the road here. So her level of excitement for this project sometimes exceeds mine. Um, and, and that's been the reality of everybody. I think we've had an absolute fantastic constellation of um, architects, builders, um, quantity surveyors, um, civil engineers who've been assisting us with this project on a pro bono basis, simply because they believe it's their project. And I also believe that. I don't believe this is a One Economy Foundation project. I think it's a project that belongs to all of us. And every single person who's had the capacity to contribute has contributed. And I, I'd just like to thank all of those people um, for their constant contribution. So one of the main things that humbles me is how we've managed to raise money in times of great need. To raise this amount of money, this 30 million which we've raised in the last year, when we know everybody's balance sheets have been impaired, is a reflection on the energy of you guys. Because I think we have provided proof of concept. Be Free does work. And this building answers one of the questions we get asked at every Be Free. When is the next one? What do we do to further this? And as Bernada said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to put it into the ground and we'll have a be free every single day. And that could have only happened because of the support that we have, the, the staff members in my office. I often get shouted at by young men all the time about, yeah, but this first lady only cares about women and girls. But they must come see my office. The same way that you notice what happened on the stage. We didn't intend for it to be demographically representative. But when you follow the right value system, it happens on its own. So I've got Bernardus in my office. I've got Biva. I call him Biva because his first name is Saddam. And it, it, so I, I, I say Biva. <laughs> I've got Sam in my office. Uh, three exceptional young men with exceptional ideas, uh, values, and energy. And then... So it, we, we, with them involved, we have the ability to also see the other perspective because we like to talk about gender issues of us versus them, and it's not. We, there's one thing that we have to do, and we all have to live together. And we are 
teaching girls to imagine a world where there's equality, but we're not teaching boys to imagine a world where there's equality. And that's a dangerous teaching because there's always pushback. There's always resistance. And with the help of the young men around us, we are managing to teach both girls and boys to imagine a world where there's equality. We also very much about destigmatization and destigmatization of anything that people are queasy about. And, and honestly, these young people get me into lots of trouble because now Bertha and her friends decide they're going to cause a shut it all, where's Labias? A shut it all down movement. And these kids go there with their beefy shirts, <laughs> saying all kinds of things. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, we've got nothing to do with that. That's really what they believe in, but they are practicing a value that we believe in, and that is to articulate your view, your sentiment in the way that you believe it to be right or wrong. Catch your flames on your own. But we will never turn away from the young people who are part of this constellation. Uh, Rodelia, with your queer activism, Anybody with whatever activism there is, people must learn to distinguish between what people are activists for and who sent them. Nobody sends young people to demonstrations. They send themselves because they believe there's an issue that is important to them. Do I agree with some of the things that they believe in? I don't. Are there some things that they say which I agree with? They are. They are. Some of the things I wouldn't say myself. So when they say that, I tell them. <laughs> and other things when they say they don't agree, it's my obligation to not disagree with them publicly. Because I'm not here to try and police their views. Nor are they here to police other people's views. We are going to coexist with our different views. And we will support one another where we can. We will never instigate each other. We will never unnecessarily disagree because we must disagree sometimes. And, and I do believe that uh, some of my conversations with Berta, with um, Labias, with Rodilio, with the likes of Rivaldo, Alina, you need to come visit me more often uh, and say hi to Paige for me. But when I do have conversations with them, I feel I learn something every time. And I feel I've become a better mother. My daughter turns 21 on Saturday. You'd think it's 42. Um, but I think I've become a better mom to my kids because a lot of the things that they complain about are really much the things that I do, sometimes even by default. So I have become conscious of my own blind spots as a parent. But I've also become more conscious of the things that other young people are saying that my own kids have said to me, which I've ignored, and how I address things. So I'm not as shouty and as impatient as I used to be. So Be Free has also built me into a better mother, a better person, more tolerant, more understanding of young people's issues. Um, and I'm grateful to all of you for forcing that learning. We often talk about the other organizations around us who have similar aspirations. And a lot of those organizations will be part of this initiative because we do believe in collaboration. So to us, this is really about, we keep on talking about Project Be Free. The press keeps asking me about Project Be Free, and we never know what to say because we haven't um, officially launched it. So we are officially launching it today. So when we're talking about Project Be Free, we're talking about this building. So we are likely to continue having Be Free movements. Rodilia, actually, we're having a Be Free in Walfish Bay very soon in the Erongo region, um, I think in the next two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> Are you part of it? Okay, fantastic. I'm happy to hear that. So, so we will be continuing with the, the Be Free gatherings, but this will be the institutionalization. I'm so proud of myself. Institutionalization. You know, there's words that people always struggle with. Like, I, I don't want to laugh, but I, I adore the Minister of Home Affairs, Franz Kapofi, but ask him to say calculation. It's a problem. <laughs> so my problem is institutionalization. So I'm so happy with myself that I got that right today. So, so to us and to the young people, 
we saying own your narrative, own your own story and tell it. And if we can play a role in facilitating you owning your narrative and your own story, we will play that role. I, th the regret that I have about Project Be Free, I wish this building was built pre-COVID because during lockdown, I realized how important this building will be in terms of young people who needed places to access wireless, young people who needed places to do homework, who needed tutors, how important sex education is because we saw teenage pregnancy rates doubling during lockdown. We saw a lot of girls not returning to school after lockdown. We saw limited access to health services, particularly on the reproductive health side. What we also see is, I don't know who knows what depot is. Come on guys, you know what depot is. It's not an injection. Is it an injection? Is depot an, is, is an injection? How do you know what depot is? <laughs> PJ the DJ. <laughs> so depot is an, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a contraceptive, but it's not a great contraceptive, particularly not for young people. And if you go to the average clinic, even as a young person, you're going to be given depot. So we want to go into that kind of detail of even finding contraceptive alternatives for young people, which are more suited for adolescents. Why are we giving adolescents contraceptives? Because they're having sex, whether we like it or not. We want to protect the adolescents who are being forced into sexual relationships where there's no consent, but we're not going to judge the adolescents who are having sex. It's happening, it's not going to stop, it's not going to go backwards, it's only going to get more. We want young people to delay sexual debuts. We don't want them to fall pregnant. But we're not going to pretend it's not happening. And I got so exasperated at one Be Free movement. I think you were there. I said, but why? Because every time we started trying to talk about something else, the conversation was always pulled back to sex. And I said, but what is it? What, what is it that you people just want to talk about sex? And why are you having sex so young? And the one girl put up her hand and she said, first lady, because it's nice. <laughs> and I looked at her. And something clicked in my mind that that is part of the problem of how we talk to young people about sex. We talk to young people about sex as if it's this horrible thing and there's only consequences. Sex is pleasurable whether we like to admit it or not. So we need to build a stronger investment case why you need to delay. Not just talk about the consequences, but also talk about why we're saying what we're saying. Moralizing about it, spiritualizing it, demonizing it. Good luck to you. We've tried that for the last, I don't know, 1,000 years. It hasn't helped. So we want to try something different. And for those who still want to have sex, they still welcome here. And we'll provide them the, with the abilities to, to protect themselves. Those who did not engage voluntarily, because when it's rape, it's not sex. No. Yeah. So I, I don't want to call it inv unconsented sex because it's not, it's rape. We'll provide the services here for post-rape care. I'm wondering whether I should say this or not, but I'm going to say it. Um, and I don't want it to be misinterpreted because we get very emotional in this country when we speak about abortion. But one thing I do want to say about our abortion laws, um, they do allow for women to have abortions when they've been raped. And we've been dealing with cases. One girl had, she was gang raped, and we helped her to go through the legal process with all the trauma that she experienced. And after a very administrative and judgmental process, she finally got the okay. And this okay has to happen within her a period of time. Otherwise, she's not eligible anymore. So there's a lot of pocket vetoes happening. A pocket veto is when you sit on something and hope that the time expires. So there's a lot of judgment in that process. There's a lot of bureaucracy in that process. Eventually, we get her through the process, and then she had to be at state hospital for nine days because they didn't have the pills in stock. 
And she came to me and she said, you know what, First Lady, I regret having gone through this process because all of my friends are buying $600 pills at Marua Mall and I should have just done that. And I didn't believe her. Veronica went on Facebook, found people selling these pills. She arranged to meet them. They didn't know who she was. And she bought them in the parking lot of Marua Mall for 600 So the law is being overtaken by the black market. These abortion pills are easily available. You speak to the nurses who work at state facilities. They'll tell you about 8 to 15 girls a month coming there with half terminations. The machine is old, it's broken, it's traumatic. So even when it's legal, it's difficult. And it's difficult because of our attitudes and the things that we say. And why did I say that? Because I know there'll be people upset that I'm talking about this. Why I'm saying it is when we look at our maternal mortality rates, there are abortion statistics in there. When we look at the number of um, children being born with defects, it's got a lot to do with what we're putting in our bodies to rid ourselves. And you will not bring your abortion numbers down if at the same time you are resisting sex education, at the same time you're resisting reproductive health care, including contraceptives, and at the same time you're resisting conversations like what we have here around sex, and then you're surprised at the abortion numbers. We do not want people to be forced to have abortions under any circumstances. We do not want young people to be falling pregnant. We do not want young people being raped. And we believe that through the programs that we'll be running here, we can reduce a lot of that by just providing access to services, non-judgmental services, access to information, and also giving hope. Because any person, whether it's an old person or a young person who lacks hope, becomes a dangerous person because they've got nothing to look forward to. And that's why we're doing the youth opportunities, the vocational training, making sure that there'll be tutors here, that there'll be character development here, that we'll be building skills here. Because once we roll the mental health challenges, the substance abuse challenges, the reproductive health challenges, then we need to start building skills. And with the help of the likes of Bonnie's, we've got lots of social workers on board, we've got psychologists on board, we've got pastors, and you may wonder why are these people talking about pastors? It came out very strongly in our focus groups, where there were young people articulating a need for weekly Bible studies. And again, we're not queasy. If young people are telling us we want a corner, a spiritual corner where we can have weekly Bible studies, we're going to provide it, as long as that's what the evidence is. If there's another group of young people saying, but we want sex education, there's going to be a corner providing sex education. And the one who wants to go to Bible studies goes to Bible studies. The one who wants to go to sex education goes to sex education. The one who wants to go to the youth opportunity corner, to the robotic center where there'll be a 3D machine goes to the 3D machine. The one who needs a design and technology tutorships goes to the design and technology tutorships. So, so each to their own. So whatever your need is, there'll be somebody in this facility providing to their need. So I want to thank those who have been historically supporting us, um, the likes of MedScheme. There's many uh, Standard Bank, First National Bank. I'm, I'm now in dangerous territory because <laughs> There's a lot. <laughs> so I want to thank each one of you. Um, and we do hope for, for more support because we'll be do a, doing a lot here. Um, we're also getting more and more support um, from overseas foundations um, who are appreciati appreciating the work that we do. And one thing that I really do want to underscore, there's a reason that One Economy Foundation isn't called Monica Kenkos. Because Monica Kenkos is a person. Um, and this isn't about a person. It's called One Economy Foundation, and this is called Project Be Free, because the intent here is that it must outlive all of us. Because as we get older, a younger cohort will take over. 
Um, and where we feeling particularly proud is many of you know that my background is I ran the biggest, it was then the biggest private equity fund in the country. I think there's bigger ones now. But I ran that fund for over a decade. So if there's somebody who really specializes in custodial relationships of, of managing capital on behalf of third parties, it's me. And that's the value that I want to bring in here, that every single cent that is provided to us is well managed. Um, and I'm a PIP. I don't know how many of you know what a PIP is. It's a politically exposed person. It's the most irritating thing to be. Because once you're a PIP, you can't even open a bank account without having to give more documentation than other people. So source of funds, all kinds of things. And the other day I checked onto an investment account and in red, I don't know if I was supposed to see that. It was like high risk, active PIP. I was like, oh, wow, okay. <laughs> so we do have rules around PIPs um, for the One Economy Foundation and around me specifically. If I'm not mistaken, I'm the only PIP um, on the board and we'll never allow more than two PIPs to be on the board and we'll never allow any transaction from the foundation to a PIP. So, I will, so I'm not even allowed to receive a board fee. If I incur any costs, which I regularly do on behalf of uh, Be Free or One Economy Foundation, I'm not allowed to get a reimbursement. So there can never be a flow of money from the One Economy Foundation to me or to any of my relatives, because this is how PIPs suck out of the foundations that they run. Another thing that we do, or that I've done, is that there'll always be a flow of money from me to the foundation, including when I die. So the One Economy Foundation is in my will, and there will be money flowing from me to the foundation while I'm alive and when I pass, because that's how much I believe in this. What I've also not done, which is typical of, um, founders of these type of foundations, they entrench themselves into the trust, meaning I can never be removed as a chairperson or when I pass, I have the ability to nominate my daughter, whoever I want to take my place as chairperson. I've got no entrenched provision. So the likelihood that in five years time, I'll say, ah, I'm tired of these Bertas and Rodilios, I want to go, then I resign as chairperson of One Economy Foundation. And I think you guys are well equipped to take it forward. And that's what we're building towards. We are depersonalizing it from me. So media, please stop with this first ladies One Economy Foundation because it's not my foundation. I'm a, I'm a chairperson. Um, I've got no rights to it. I've got, I can be outvoted at any board meeting. They can even uh, expel me. I've got a lovely board. They like me. I like them, but you never know. <laughs> So I'm, I'm happy to take that risk. And I'd like to close with um, welcoming Berta and McVeron to... McVeron, where are you? He's not here. Um, there are two new youth directors. We used to have a youth uh, director called uh, Mavis Braga. And she grew old. Like, I, I told her, you need to stay youth. But no, she chose to grow older. So we had to replace her with um, these two. Um, and I'm... It's the first and the last time I'm going to be referring to you as youth directors because you are directors. You have the same value as all the other directors, but they will be playing a special role in making sure that they keep us accountable. So again, for those of you who are not aware of how the One Economy Foundation Board is structured, we are about building a bridge between the first economy and the second economy. So we've got second economy participants. We've got a car guard um, who... and. Uh, Beata, you saw it yesterday. He's one of our most valuable contributors um, on our board. So we send everybody to training for board governance and uh, directors and fiduciary duties. We've got a, a woman who has retrenched and runs her own tax shop. Um, we have a former police officer. We have a former managing partner of a big four audit firm. We have a chairperson and a founder of a, um, uh, it's not really private equity. I can probably say it's private equity. Um, and the idea there is to have a combination of skills across sectors. And our experience is you cannot say you are about this if it's not representative in your structures. So thank you very much for onboarding. Um, we'll always try to be demographically sensitive from an ethnicity perspective from a gender perspective um, and from every perspective 
that you can imagine. And I think we've managed to achieve that not only in our staffing complement at One Economy Foundation, we've also managed to achieve that um, at board level. And I'm grateful to all of you. I don't know if any media has any questions. I'm happy to take questions. We're very transparent. I'm not a politician, so don't come here with your funny questions. I'll also answer you funny. <laughs> so, so I don't have the limits they have. <laughs> So if you do have any questions now, you're happy to shoot them off and I'm happy to respond. If you'd like to ask me questions after the event, I'm also happy to stick around. I've got another meeting right after, but I am happy for about 10 minutes to have a quick conversation with media. So if there's no question now, um, you just grab me when we're done. Um, and thank you very much, all of you, for coming. And um, for those who celebrate, happy Easter. Um, and for those who don't, have a lovely long weekend. Okay. And we're going to do that. And what we didn't mention is we're only starting construction in July. Yeah. We're only starting construction in July. So we are going to have a small groundbreaking ceremony here to st because this is the site on which we'll be building. But the first brick will likely be laid in July. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.